This is scary. It is scary. When you are deceived by the enemy and you think it's of God and it's not. Mm -hmm. You know why this is scary? Because it didn't end in the 1500s. No, it's here today. It's here today. This is Father Thomas Keating. Very briefly in this uh, modest diagram here, what what, uh, I'm trying to say, uh, suppose that this is our order awareness, the stream of consciousness that we're experiencing during the time of prayer. And here are a few boats that are going by, boats representing thoughts, feelings, images, and so on. And there's usually a a fleet of them. Sometimes the whole United States Navy seems to be going down with all the guns banging and so on. So whatever your experience, you're having Uh, thoughts going by at this level. At a deeper level, let's call this the ordinary level of of our awareness, and let's call this the spiritual level of our awareness, which you're really not aware of most of the time except at a peak experience or or when life or tragedy or something brings you to that place. So we're mostly unaware of what might be called the river itself on which all our thoughts and faculties are resting. So we're kind of absorbed or dominated in our ordinary psychological life by the objects of of events and people and our emotional reactions to them. The purpose then of the centering prayer is to move from this level to this level. And indeed, not to stop there, because the, the human being has, a, has greater depths than that, but to move even deeper to the level of the true self, which is our participation in the divine life, and the divine presence itself, as the source of our being at every level. And it's accessing or awakening or awakening our awareness to this presence that is the ultimate goal of of contemplative prayer or centering prayer. But to reach it, we have to pass through the spiritual level and to awaken the true self and and whatever of, of God's ultimate divine presence he may may want to share with us, which is a whole new life, which is a transformed life, and which it seems to me is what the gospel invites us to, especially in St. John, where Jesus speaks of inviting us into the same union and unity that, that he experiences with the Father in the Holy Spirit. Hence, this is so important, again, from the perspective of prayer as relationship. Now, there are lots of prayers at this level, our vocal prayers, our reflections, and our divine office, and and the sacraments. But each of these things, especially the sacraments, has this mystical mystical depth, or this mystagogic uh, uh, teaching, which which uh, helps us to understand the, the symbols of the church from this level in which they are transformed and their meaning becomes immensely more powerful, more attractive, and more personal, as well as at the same time bonding us with bonding us with everyone else who is having a similar experience in grace. And and that, uh, we might say that the centering prayer is primarily involved in awakening this particular level as a preparation for going deeper still, which is the work of of the various stages of contemplative prayer and mystical life. I do think I was always a contemplative, and I believe it must be a mystery that I can't completely explain. There seems to be some people who are um, for whatever reason, deeply drawn to the contemplative life. And I did grow up in this 
church that was more centered on the word than on the word than on the word than on ritual liturgy and the contemplative tradition. And I read Thomas Merton's uh, Seven Story Mountain when I was in my 20s. And it was a revelation to me. And yet it wasn't a revelation at all. Because when I read about this interior life, and when I read about the contemplative life, I recognized it. It was the oddest thing. It was as if I had come home to something I already knew. So it was both a relief and it was an affirmation of something I seemed to know. Um, maybe our souls are wired in certain ways. There seems to be prophets and, and activists, and there seems to be the more contemplative, although I do think they're joined at the hip. I do think that if you are being a true contemplative, it opens your heart to compassion, and that if you have compassion, you have to have some sort of vision of the world that in incorporates justice and inclusion and has this active component to it, which I've always had. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> but the contemplative experience has been the real base and um, core of my life always. And I don't know how to explain that really, except to say that in the deepest part of me, I, what matters is my connection to the divine, my connection to the divine, to understanding the presence of the divine in life and in myself and myself and myself and myself and myself and being um, being aware of that. Building stuff on top. Probably the, from my perspective, the most. Uh, intriguing representative of this type of spirituality would be a woman named Sue Monk Kidd. Uh, she's, uh, she's probably uh, the poster girl uh, for why we're doing this DVD here. She was a Southern Baptist uh, Sunday school teacher in a small town in South Carolina. She um, um, was just a typical normal Christian um, a wife, a mother, you know, nothing eccentric about her, nothing offbeat. Is there anything such as a normal Christian? That's yes. Right. <laughs> so, um, somebody handed her a book by Thomas Merton in her Sunday school class. Uh -huh. And she, um, she started to get into uh, contemplative prayer, and this is, what she, uh, this is what she wrote. This is a book she did called God's Joyful Surprise. This came out probably in the late 80s. And she talked about... Um, it was the books I was continuing to discover that introduced me to the kind of prayer I was looking for. And she talked about uh, ways of being with God and uh, practices that opened the door to oneness with Him. And she said they called it contemplation. And she said how she was amazed that she didn't know anything about this ancient and powerful tradition in Christian, you know, Christian history. Right. And she says, I was ready. And in this book, you know, she talks about how she, she actually used mantras. There's a number of words she used. She would repeat over and over again, and she would go into the alpha state or the thoughtless state. Well, this book uh, was endorsed by, uh, it's defunct now, but there used to be a magazine called Virtue. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I do. And uh, this was Virtue Magazine's best book of the year. Okay, it was also endorsed by today's Christian woman who said that uh, the message and challenge of the book is profound. If you ever wondered if your spiritual life needed some deepening, this book will awaken your longing and set you off on your own spiritual journey. Okay, today's Christian woman. Okay, this one says, suggests some disciplines for cultivating an interior quietness and a richer personal experience of God's love. That's Moody Monthly. So this book was endorsed by all, you know, all the heavy hitters in the mainstream evangelical media. Well, that was the late 80s. In the mid-90s, Sue Monk Kidd came out with uh, her third book called The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. And, it's, and the subtitle is A Woman's Journey from Christian Tradition, that's conservative evangelical Christianity, to the sacred feminine. Now she worships the goddess Sophia. Yeah. Sophia being the goddess wisdom. Yes. Right. And now she says that um, 
uh, quotes Teilhard de Chardin. You're familiar with him, right? And Jesuit his priest. God in everything view, and she says that uh, you know that uh, this mystical awakening and all the great religious traditions uh, uh, in Zen, it's known as Samadhi, and the divine is one. And she says, for those who go deep into spiritual practice, that's contemplative prayer, at some moment the veil slips away and you see what is. And everything that it, that is has a spiritual essence. Goddess offers us the holiness of everything. The holiness of everything. Well, of everything, that means Satan is holy, right? There's, uh, the, the golden calf was holy. Right. You know, all these uh, uh, pagan religions that one finds in the Old Testament were holy. Right. It, it resembles a lot uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and self-actualization that, that uh, came out of psychology. Well, theoretically, Adolf Hitler was self-actualized, so yeah. he was fulfilled. You <laughs> so, know. so uh, you know, all these uh, Moody Monthly was endorsing this book saying that, you know, this woman really has the, the answer to your spiritual dryness. Today's Christian Woman, Virtue Magazine. And she discovered this contemplative tradition. Well, where it led her was the sacred feminine, you know, the goddess. And, and there's a, a section in here where she's in her Baptist church, during Southern Baptist church during this transition. And the pastor's holding up the Bible saying, this is our sole and ultimate authority. And she gets this, this sensation of something rippling within her. And it's just spreading out. And, and uh, she says she never had such a profound... Uh, uh, feeling is what she was going through and this voice kept saying no 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 my final and ultimate authority is the divine voice in my own soul period why is all of this important I mean why should Christians be concerned try to drag that together for people you know from what I've uh, been able to uh, discover about this movement people that do it do not go in a conservative uh, route they go toward an interspiritual route. They don't go in the right direction. In other words, it doesn't lead them to the scripture. No, it doesn't it lead them, them to else. being evangelists for Jesus Christ. It leads them to embrace other religions. All right. Any closing thoughts? Yes, basic, that's basically it. That, uh, you know, I would, uh, I believe that we're seeing Bible prophecy unfold and that people need to uh, wake up and they need to uh, d decide what camp they're going to be in. Matthew 24, Jesus says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and you'll see many. That word, and many, there in the Greek is palus, which means a sore number. And now we're seeing with, in, on Oprah Winfrey with Eckhart Tolle and people like that, that uh, if you have the Christ consciousness, which is being one of your higher self, that makes you a Christ. That Jesus was a model for Christ consciousness. 28 million people downloaded uh, the thing that uh, Oprah and Eckhart Tolle did on the Internet. 28 million downloaded it. So we're, we're talking about a mass movement. And in that 10-week uh, series, you know, the, the, uh, the, the gist of it was that Jesus modeled the Christ consciousness, and now we need to get the Christ consciousness also, which would make us a Christ just like him. Right. And that's what Jesus warned of. Many right. shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Uh, Paulus, which means a sore number, like millions and millions and millions. Well, the second hour of the day, um is the Immaculate Conception for me, which sounds like an unlikely kind of name for this, but I chose it because of the meaning of Immaculate Conception in the most symbolic and um, metaphoric way. Um, not dogmatic at all. When you think about the Immaculate Conception, you're really talking about something unblemished and pure. And all of the mystics of the church spoke of a place in the soul they called the divine spark. The divine spark. In, in French, it's the virgin point. Um, it's that place in the soul that is purely God, the divine, untouched by anything else. It's the Immaculate Conception in all of us. It's the Immaculate Conception in all of us. So it is our deepest connection to the divine. So that hour of the day is to acknowledge that and to connect with that, to tap in again 
to this place in our own soul that is the deepest and purest thing, the divine spark. And I do that in several ways. Um, I may sit and meditate with one of my icons, one of my icons. Um, I may pray, I may read, I may journal, but most of the time, and my favorite thing is to um, go out to my dock and sit by the water and watch the tides and the birds. Um, the best way to pray for me is to sit and be and um, n not try so hard. The charismatic movement has made no qualms of accepting contemplative prayer either. However, as you will see in some circles, they've renamed it soaking prayer, and it's still the same thing. Hi, my name is Stephen Venable, and I teach a course called The Mystical Life of Communion here at IHOPU. IHOPU, so that's Mike Bickle, he's connected to Bob Jones and Paul Kane and Rick Joyner and all those Kansas City prophets and NAR prophets. And the heart behind this course is, um, at its center, is deep interior communion with Jesus through His Spirit. And the whole course is focused on looking into the scripture and seeing an invitation to not just know things about Him, to not just understand the truth of who He is, which is so important, but to actually commune with Him, to experience Him within us through the Holy Spirit that dwells within. And in church history, um, this is typically being called contemplative prayer or meditation, called contemplative prayer or meditation or meditation. And it is really a, a lost grace or a lost art in the modern church. Um, and as a result, our spirituality can be um, so shallow and so wanting. Uh, and inside of us, there are all of these deep uh, longings and desires, and they can only be met in Jesus. Um, and in many ways, the body of Christ in, in, our, in our day and in this hour is like a, a volcano that's about to erupt. Because we have all of these longings and yearnings, and yet um, no one is telling us how to find Jesus in a way that answers those. Um, And as we look back in history, some of the people who do that the best um, are what the church has called the mystics. And thus the, the part of the title called Mystical Life of Communion. Um, and so the mystics who were, who were just really men and women who were set on fire, were set on fire, were set on fire. Like with love for Jesus. Um, point us and give us inspiration um, as to how to find him in, the, in that way. And so we, uh, throughout the course, we look at their lives and their testimonies in order to gain insight and to be encouraged. But, but for the most part, we're just beholding the beauty of Jesus and seeing how the New Testament reveals that he, that he has invited us, that he desires us um, to know him deeply on the inside. So I encourage you to jump in uh, and to take the course and and I know the Lord will meet you through it. What is wrong with looking at Jesus' example and his submission to the Father? Or the Apostle Paul, or Apostle Peter, or Apostle John? Why should we have to look to these mystics who obviously sought ways outside Scripture? John and Carol are convinced that first comes the Great Commandment, then the Great Commission. With this in mind, they've begun an exciting new initiative that puts receiving from and listening to God right at the top of people's priorities. Their vision is to see people in all the nations of the world soaking and receiving the presence of God. Soaking is a term used to describe the practice of expectantly wait is a term used to describe the practice of expectantly waiting and resting in God's love rather than striving in prayer. Soaking is a great word because it implies that you're soaking in something, and that something is the Holy Spirit, and it is the presence of God. And we could talk about waiting on God, we could talk about tarrying, which would be an older word, 
but there's an expectation. So soaking prayer is a, is a term we decided to use because it was new and fresh, but it, it entails contemplative prayer where you're thinking about and wondering about, meditating on the things that God speaks back to you. So it's not a one-way prayer where it's God, here's my list of things that we need, you know, send money and send help or all of that. But it's, oh God, I, I want your presence. I want you. I want to be in that presence. And then as we receive that presence, there's this life-changing dynamic that fills us, Carol. Mm -hmm. And it, it isn't necessarily all quiet. It can get quite boisterous and quite powerful really when the Holy Spirit actually comes and increases his presence people get so filled they think they're going to explode so that's what soaking is getting wrecked by God getting wrecked by God getting wrecked by God well right now we're going to tell you about a prayer service where resting is allowed and even encouraged. And here to explain it is my dear friend, Marguerite Evans. You're the national coordinator for soaking centers for Catch the Fire, for Catch the Fire. For Catch the Fire, for Catch the Fire. Why, why soaking prayer? Why, why, do you, why do you even call it that? Well, it's really just soaking in the Father's love. It's resting in the Father's love. So we use the soaking. Um, it's actually come from the, the Greek word baptis, the baptismo. Mm -hmm. And it's just resting and just being in the Lord's presence. Not just in and out, but take some time, some quality time. It's really active rest. Why, why, why do you call it active rest? I've heard that phrase before because mm -hmm. I've, I've actually been through this and mm -hmm. I've, I've actually been through this and, 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 and I found that very unusual phrase, mm -hmm. you know, to, to keep your mind active at the same mm -hmm. time, get in, just, just rest in the Lord. Because you expect to, to connect with the Father, to be with the Father. Because soaking is not really doing anything. It is being with someone and it's being with the Father. And it's expecting Him to touch you and to touch you and to touch you and communicating with Him and, and just be with Him. Because we're so good in doing things for the Lord and, you know, all that. But we need to just take time <laughs> to be with Him. We're, 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 we're re really good at being Martha's and not so good at being Mary's. And, and I know what, I, for me, the first time I went through it was in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in, just incredible. The, the Lord actually gave me that verse before we started this whole week process mm -hmm. of getting into it. And it was also amazing to, to try to go through this in the middle of jet lag. And um, I found myself getting a little too deep in intercession and, <laughs> and then waking up in, in, in various points where I had fallen asleep. But you guys don't, you don't mind that. And, yeah. and in fact, you encourage it. Why? Yeah. Because it's really a time where we just allow the Lord to do what He wants to do in our lives. So when we're in that time of soaking, the Father sometimes comes and just pour His love over on us. Sometimes He comes and empowers us. Sometimes He comes and gives people incredible ideas. And really in the day and time we live in, it's very important for us to know what the Father thinks about things and what His strategies are. Mm -hmm. So when we spend time with Him, we really hear His heart and we really just get filled with His presence. Bear with me here, please. I will get back to the charismatic and templative stuff, but I really believe this clip by Warren Smith to be key. How all this stuff fits together in the coming of the one world religion. Remember that name, Barbara Merks Hubbard, for an upcoming clip. They're all saying the same thing. Barbara Marks Hubbard, by the way, how many have heard of Barbara Marks Hubbard other than just the reference that was made here? Not too many. Barbara Marks Hubbard was nominated for Vice President of the United States at the Democratic National Convention in 1984. How do you like that? She's on first name basis with Gorbachev, who's very involved in all this stuff. And by the way, Wayne Peterson made it clear that Gorbachev is a follower of Maitreya. That's according to a man who is very highly tied in with Maitreya. He said that Gorbachev's wife went to India to be with the guru Sai Baba, but yet they're calling themselves Christians. The word Christian really doesn't mean a whole lot anymore. It doesn't mean much to, you know, somebody says, I'm a Christian. So all this stuff's coming together, but the thing that really troubled me was that Hubbard 
received from her Christ, again, after contemplating the Lord's Prayer, being in an Episcopalian monastery, and also in another uh, circumstance, she was uh, meditating and contemplating a passage from Corinthians. There's a lesson there. We're being told to get into contemplative prayer by all these church leaders these days. These New Agers weren't even believers, and they were contemplating Scripture when they got their false visions and all these false Christs coming through. They didn't test the spirits, neither did I. I didn't know that the ball of light, demonic, felt good, seemed to be good. I was told I had a lot of help on the other side. Now you've got Dr. Oz saying, you know, endorsing sight books by psychics to tell you to meditate and, and, and contact spirit guides and get their help. Why? Because the world's in crisis. The world is falling apart so dramatically that the, that the spirit world is so concerned about this earth that they want to come, they want to help us, they want to contact us, and we need to meditate and get their advice because they know best. And, and what did it say in Isaiah? Should not a people consult their God, not familiar spirits. But the thing that was really troubling, I was aware of this. Well, I did an article years ago, you can still find it on the internet, it was called Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. And I mentioned that um, some of the contact that, like the guru that I was you know, following at that time was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. He would just touch what would be called, you know, New Age terms, the third eye, and people would go into ecstasy, they'd go into laughter, and I'm watching you know, Holy Ghost bartender Rodney Howard Brown, just people are just falling on the floor laughing hysterically. And then meanwhile, Hubbard's talking about how people in the future planetary Pentecost are going to have the joy of the force rippling through their being. And I'm going, whoa. It looked like holy laughter was a dress rehearsal for, for some kind of a future bogus planetary Pentecost that would seem to be the second coming of Christ within each person. So this whole idea... Of, of that energy, that force. And, and I quoted Hubbard in a couple of places and also mentioned, you know, I think about It this. isn't just contemplative prayer that people in the church have adopted from the East. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing is the highest stage of meditation. This way it reduces tension, it reduces stress, and gives relax to your body and mind. <laughs> ho, ho! Ho 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 and there are literally thousands of laughter clubs across the world. मेरे खुद को अस्थमा हो गया था जो हाशी योग करने से मैं बिल्कुल आज बिल्कुल ठीक हूँ बिल्कुल ओके हूँ। and hear. They heard them speak in a tongue, but what did they see? For them to think they was drunk, they must have thought they was drunk. They were acting like drunks.
Thousands of seekers, most of them from broken or unstable families, and already emotionally wounded, are becoming victims of the gurus. I did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it kundalini meditation. It starts off with a cathartic breathing, and the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body, and you just breathe. launching pad for some of you tonight and I say tonight you are coming out of transition you are coming out of the wilderness of transition and you are coming into a place of takeover and possession over and possession over and possession of the inheritance that God has for you in the name of Jesus I release that over your life tonight and I say be anointed with fresh oil from heaven tonight quickly grab hands with one another Quickly grab hands with this coming and anointing that's going to sweep right across this altar right here. Everybody becomes a catcher. Hallelujah. Take them over, Holy Ghost. Take them over, Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's the anointing of God. It's a radical last day anointing. It's an end day anointing. An end time anointing. There it is. 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 Here it is. Oh, that's real. This is real. This is real. This is real. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That is a whole new level of breakthrough in your life tonight. A whole new level of breakthrough in your life tonight. A lot of the false teachers in the charismatic movement try to say that Kundalini started with Christianity first and that the devil stole it. LOL, I am sorry, but show me scripture and verse in context, please, of where any of these manifestations are. Acts 2 says they were speaking in diverse tongues, not doing kundalini. That sounds kind of like something Bethel said in Physics of Heaven. That's me. <clears throat> Run. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell, and it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.